glasses. Is the lighting okay or is there too much glare? I passed out an evaluation up front um, in case people have to leave early, but also so you'll know what to be looking for as you're listening. Um, so you can give me all fives right off the, off the bat if you'd like and, and do it that way. Or actually, um, evaluate me honestly. I prefer the honesty. Um, we're here today um, to look at, I think, a real important issue. And I'm experimenting for the very first time with um, all this computer stuff, so please bear with me. Um, I, I actually wrote out my whole talk because I thought with trying to do the mouse and keep you know, not going back to the crowd or stand in front of the thing, I might lose my place. So bear with me if I read a little bit more than I probably should or I fumble with the mouse, but I'm trying to, trying to learn how to use this stuff. It's a lot of fun. And I'd like to put in a plug for everybody learning how to use the presentation software. Because look, this is a lot nicer than the ugly overhead of your one colored monitor. So uh, we'll take it from there. As hopefully um, many of you know, I'm Peggy Norwood, and I'm a new um, professor here at Thomas Nelson in the psychology department. And um, it's been a, a nice year so far. This is my second semester. A few people coming in a little bit late. Um, what I, I wanted to share was a little bit about my back background. I was trained as a clinical psychologist, so I think I'm going to. I think I'm in a good position to talk about some of the behavior problems that we'll be looking at above and beyond just bad attitudes, but actually <coughs> mental illness and emotional disturbance. And as a therapist, I work with a lot of really sick people, really chronically ill people, and I worked with them for quite a long while, a lot of long-term treatment, and, and for many, many years. And I developed over the years a motto that I think is pretty relevant that you've probably heard before. And as a therapist, I always thought those who can do and those who burn out teach. So that's how I ended up here at Thomas Nelson. I got pretty burned out working with all these, I, I do say crazy people, because in the world there really are some crazy people. People say that's not politically correct, but I say it anyhow. So that's how I ended up at Thomas Nelson was I burned out. And one of the things I noticed when I came for my interview, it was very apparent right away, and I didn't ask about it, was that everybody here at Thomas Nelson was so old. I mean, had been here for so long, and, um, I figured that must mean this is a good place to be. If people have been around for it. everybody on my committee and who came to my um, teaching module had all been here for like 10 years, 15 years, some 20 years, 22 years. And I figured that must mean this is a really great place to be. And I wanted to be here, so that's, I think it all worked out real well. Now what some of you may have noticed in being here for so many years is that things have changed. Times are different. And I, just by a show of hands, people who have been here more than 10 years, okay, almost everybody. Are things different now in the classroom, meaning students and the types of behavior problems you see, the frequency of the behavior problems in the past 10 years, things have changed? Okay. Um, that's what we're going to take a look at. I want to share a few um, stats and backgrounds. I went to the end, is there also the BCCS? Uh, where did, did you make it? You got there towards the very end. I think you might have missed this piece. They shared some stats with us on um, what students are looking like system-wide in terms of age and experience and things of that nature. And while our students may look a little bit different, I want to share the stats with you to, to show you what the trends are looking like across the system. And we can assume that our students probably um, represent that. Isn't that neat? That's the fun this time. Uh, the mean age um, across the BCCS for the students, and I have all this on um, handout too. I'll let you know what's not in the handout that you may want to write down. The mean age is 29, and the median age is 26, and I don't have to explain to the math professors the difference between mean and median. You can ask them if you're not sure. Um, over 50% of the first time students who are in college for the very first time are under age 19, and I think that's pretty significant in terms of behavior problems. Over 75% a great majority of them are under the age of 24, and that's very significant. We're seeing that our students are younger and younger. The very first time students who are not experienced, who don't know what to expect, who don't know kind of what the, um, the unwritten rules are about being in the classroom. Or they know and they just don't care. It's part of the problem, too. And our, our pretty much our bread and butter group that we've uh, traditionally served, the 25 to 44 age group is declining. It's getting smaller and smaller. Okay. This took me about <coughs> five hours to figure out how to get this chart on here. It's still not quite how I wanted it, but um, I let it, I let it go. I'm a perfectionist, but not to the point where I was going to drive myself crazy. Um, I think 
pick the pink areas, the 18 to 21 group, so you see that's a large part of the pie. And then the other bigger part, and I couldn't figure out how to get the percentages on there, is the 25 to 34 age group. Okay, so I think we're seeing that our students are getting younger and younger, and in my opinion, more and more immature. Not necessarily just because they're young, they're immature, but that's my observation. The students are more and more immature. I think they have um, what I call the microwave and MTV mindset where they want everything fast and they want it entertaining, preferably fast and entertaining. MTV videos are flashy and uh, upbeat and up-tempo and it's just everything's happening all at once. And that's what they're raised on, whether it's Sesame Street. I was watching Sesame Street the other day with my kids and they had this um, ABC song. It was on and off like this, but it was the catchiest, you know, upbeat, visually stimulating version of the ABC song I've ever seen in us. I've been singing it ever since. So that's kind of what, what students are raised on nowadays. And then they come to Thomas Nelson and they've got to sit through your 90-minute class or your three-hour class, and frankly, some of you are not very entertaining. <laughs> and so they're used to this quick and fast and entertaining and flashy and splashy, and then they come and sit through your class. And most of you aren't as funny as, as I am, so it's a, <laughs> there's a problem there. Um, Think of what, what students will do if they actually enjoy something and they're really motivated. And I want to make this contrast to show you they have the capacity to delay gratification and sit there through something very, very long. But they're kind of trained to want to be really, really entertained. Students hear that their favorite performers come into the Coliseum and they get excited right away. Okay? I don't think they get excited when they read in the course bulletin. <coughs> Ann Andrews is coming to Thomas Nelson. All oh, right. That probably didn't happen. But if, um, I don't know who the hottest star is today, um, Prince or the artist formerly known as Prince or somebody, if they found out he was coming to the Coliseum, they would wait in line overnight with their pillowcases and their sleeping bags. They'd take all of their hard-earned money that they've saved up. They'd want to buy uh, the most expensive ticket. They'd want to sit up front. They don't want the seat up in the balcony. They want to be right up in the front. They're going to look forward to it for weeks and weeks in advance. They're going to get dressed for the occasion. They're going to stay awake during the whole concert. They're going to applaud like mad and chant, we want Prince, we want Prince. During the concert, they're going to flick their bit, and they're all going to go like this while he's performing. When it's all done, he gets a standing ovation. I don't know about you, but that hasn't happened to me in the classroom. So students really don't show the same kind of enthusiasm for what we've got to offer as they show for some other things. And I think that has a lot to do with just kind of how, how students nowadays, this, this younger age group, what they've been exposed to and what they expect. And I think that, that can create a, a problem. Now that, I remember when I was in college, um, even something like on the last day of class, if you really liked the professor, we used to clap. You know, you all used to do that. At my college, we used to clap. If we thought it was a good professor, on the very last day, everybody would applaud for them. But that kind of, attitude and, and I guess respect and regard for the instructor, we don't see that as much anymore. And that's, that's really what I want to talk about. Um, I was playing Aretha Franklin in the background, respect she's singing about. And I think a big part of why um, we maybe are seeing more behavior problems in the classroom is that students aren't holding us in as high regard as they used to. We're not seen as authority figures as we should be. Um, they, they're, they're here, they say they've paid their money and we work for them. I've paid my tuition, where's my seat? I just, you know, I may not even really have to show up. I'm a consumer, I've paid my money. And there's not that regard for us as an authority figure, as an expert, and I think that just sets an atmosphere in the classroom where they're inclined to act out in ways that we never would have dreamed of. Someone was asking, do you think it's a gender thing that the female instructors maybe are not as intimidating a presence? So that question is kind of in line with what I'm talking about, that if we're not seen as authority figures, we're not treated with respect, um, and we don't command that respect, we're going to see a lot more behavior problems in the classroom. Now this idea of students as consumers, I think, is, serves as a kind of a good backdrop for what I'll be talking about today as well. Um, that they are paying their money, they have selective purchasing power, we're all concerned about everybody going over to Tidewater Community College instead of choosing us. And so we really are tiptoeing around sometimes. If I confront this student and require them to behave, maybe they'll just leave and never come back to Thomas Nelson and we'll lose FTE and I'll be out of a job eventually. So we're all real interested in customer service, which is important anyway. 
Um, but when we start treating students like customers, I think that has some important implications for um, what we see in the classroom. Everybody has heard the old adage, the customer is always right. So if the customer, meaning your student, is always right, that means that it's okay for them to show up late. If the customer is always right, it's okay for them to be disruptive. If the customer is always right, it's okay for them to come in unprepared. They've paid their money. If that's how they want to spend their 90 minutes in their classroom, they think that's okay. I had a student come to my class and fall asleep the whole time. And I walked up and you know, I tapped him. I said, please wake up. And he said, you know, do you work? And she said, yes. And, uh, I said, well, where do you work? She said, I work in the grocery store. I said, how would you like if I came to where you work and laid out in your waiting area and fell asleep? You, well, that wouldn't be very nice. But she felt she paid for her, month, her class, so she wanted to sleep her way through it. That was just fine. So this whole attitude of uh, consumerism and customer service is great you know, for business, but what is it doing for us in the classroom and, and how does it affect our ability to manage the classroom? So we'll be looking at that as well. Any questions about that? idea, that concept? Anybody think I'm way off the mark with it or it sounds like it makes sense? Okay. Well, let's go ahead then and play the game Family Feud. And we need to find a way to split up in even numbers. We're going to have two families. So you guys have to probably move around a lot. If you guys want to, some of you want to move over there and be with that family over there, we need an even number of people on each team. And there's a method to my madness. There's a reason why I'm asking you to play Family Feud. I'll explain in a minute. So try to get an even distribution, and you guys decide who you want as the head of your household. Pick a family name, just make up a name. We're going to be the Joneses or the whoever, and, and who's the head of the household, and don't let us see Dr. Davis. Want somebody else to emerge as the leader over here. When this family over here get together, you guys are move over, get up, and move around. You thought you'd all sit in the back. Join the family. Okay. Howard, you want to be the patriarch? <laughs> no, no, no. Come on, Daddy. Okay? And we're going to be playing family <laughs> in just a minute. <laughs> and you're Harry and but I taught here as an adjunct a couple years ago in the That's evening, right. and I never had problems in the evening. And I'm sure some of you who have taught at night know what I'm talking about. It's a different, uh, at the risk of stereotyping, a different type of student who comes at night. Um, so this is something I just started doing last semester. Um, I did it as part of a review game for the final, and I said, hey, this might work real nice for the beginning of the semester. So I used it in all five of my classes this semester, and it's worked wonders. So what, what we're doing is playing Family Feud, and it's a metaphor for what I expect from the students in the classroom, that they're all, they all have to participate. They can't just sit in the back and hide out, but we're all working together co collaboratively and problem solving together, and that also learning can be fun, okay? So hopefully you'll have a little bit of fun playing the game. Now what I use as the topic for the Family Feud game is it goes a long way as well in terms of managing the class and setting expectations. And when I get the heads of the household up front, I'll tell you what the topic is, because that's a question you're going to have to answer. So who's the head over here? The leader. <laughs> Howard's the leader? Come on. Howard, come on down. I'm not going to be like, remember Richard Dawson used to kiss everybody as yeah. they came up? I'm not Richard Dawson. Who's the head of the household over here? We've got to climb over 20 people. Come here. What? <laughs> Stand right, right here, Howard. Start easing my way back here. Okay, this is the button. Forgive me, I haven't been battered. Some of you know my husband. I've been studying uh, Taekwondo, and oh, I blocked geez. a kick on Tuesday, <laughs> that, and I'm just a mess all over. You, you might wonder how I'm advancing and progressing. I'm actually getting a test for a blue belt, and I look like this. But that's another story. This is going to be the buzzer, and you guys have to put your hands at the side, okay? And this will be the buzzer. I'll, you know how to play Family Feud, right? When I ask, the, I'll say the topic, 100 professors have been surveyed, and the, they said blah, blah, blah. And the top answer is, and if they can guess it, boom, they hit the, the buzzer. No hitting me, no getting loud, because I'll do the old, you know, the old me. <laughs> Laurel and Hardy, okay? The question is, name the top 10 things, behaviors, considered rude by professors. Okay, Howard? 
Just, well, just name one. And if okay. you can name one that's up there, your team gets to steal it. Talking in class. Talking in class. Good answer. Okay. So he got it. Yay, Dad. We go back to the Thomas family over here, or the Taylor family, we'll call them. The Howard Taylor family. Go sit back with your team. Now you remember how Family Feud is played, right? If they can guess the remaining items, and I'll check my list and see if they've got them, and then we'll put them. I couldn't figure out how to do this on the on the screen. So we have to go out of order. But they've got to brainstorm what they think the ten behaviors are. If they get three strikes, you guys get to steal, and you win by just coming up with the one to play, right? So you guys brainstorm, what do you think they are? One at a time, I'm going to go to each family member, and you've got to give the answer. And it's a good answer, the whole family goes, good answer, Peggy, are we supposed to be Coming in late. She said, coming in late. And the survey says? Yes. OK. Next. Sleeping. Sleeping during class. And the survey says? Yes, it's on there. Just getting up and walking out. Bam! Oh, sorry. It's not on my survey. Sorry. Not leaving early. Not leaving early. It's not on the survey. Doesn't mean it's not rude. It doesn't mean it's survey. Talking in class. That was already said. That's two strikes. Eating in class. Although that's good. Three strikes. You guys get to steal it. We're out. You have five seconds to come up with an answer, and if you get it, you get to steal the whole thing. Eating success. So we're going to review what my 10 answers were. Packing up before class is over is my personal pet peeve. I hate it. I hate when it's quarter of and I still have five more minutes and they're shuffling like I don't realize what time it is and we better start shuffling now because she's going to end, you know, she's going to run over because so-and-so professor always does so I know she will too and I've got to go all the way over to the ITT building. So they're packing and shuffling and I start talking louder and louder, silly me, till I catch up. <laughs> Why am I talking so loud? I still have five minutes. Then I start talking to the front row about the quiz we're going to have next week, and all of a sudden everybody gets quiet. So that's my pet peeve. Talking while others are talking was mentioned. Sleeping in class, especially with snoring, they have Doing some other <laughs> courses, classwork during my class. Uh, you know, I teach psychology, and they're graphing. They've got their graphing calculator. You know, you math professors are so good. They're doing their graphs and stuff, and I'm talking about psychology. I hate that. And this is actually what I do with my class. We go through this game, and they guess, and they come up with good ones I've never even seen yet. So I, you guys have been around 20 years. They're probably doing it in your class. Passing notes, I hate. Pagers going off, that's a new phenomenon. Cell phones ringing during class. Sorry if I'm drunk tonight. Giving ridiculous excuses. What I mean by that is they missed the quiz, they didn't hand in their assignment on time, and they give you these stupid excuses. That's just rude and insults my intelligence. Last semester there was a, a storm or something, and a student told me he didn't make it to class for the quiz because he said, did you see that tree that fell on Big Bethel Road right at the entrance by the school? I said, no, I never come that way. I come in off Magruder. Well, I live right over there, and that tree fell on my house. Yeah, right. You know, you still could have come to school, OK? So those ridiculous excuses. Um, you see foul and offensive language. I heard someone say that, but the team didn't want to agree on that. Students who never come to class, never give it their all, but then at the, the final hour, they're begging for extra credit. They haven't done anything they've been they're supposed to do that's required, but they want to work, you know, work their little heads off for extra credit. <laughs> Arriving late and being disrupted, not necessarily in any particular order, but I, I lied. It wasn't really a survey. We did 10 things I made up. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so those are, in, in two semesters, 
answer is this is what I came up with. I can only imagine what you've got for your list after 20 years. Okay? So top 10 behaviors considered rude. Now how I use this in the classroom is as they're brainstorming and they're answering and they're having fun, everybody's participating, they're collaborating, they're problem solving. Now I set an expectation. They know, they, I tell them, my number one pet peeve is packing up early. So now for the rest of the semester, anybody who starts packing up early, somebody's going, wait, you remember she said that's her pet peeve. So I've been able to kind of set an expectation in a fun way, in a not, not a very mean and nasty way, but they know what I think is rude and they know they probably shouldn't do that. Now some of them choose to do it anyway and they're gonna do whatever they're gonna do regardless of what I say. But there's very many who kind of out of inexperience, remember 50% of our first time students never been in college before is this immature group, young group anyway. Um, they may not really think to, to say passing notes really is unacceptable. So this is a nice fun way to let them know what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. So that, that's how you fit. Okay? What I want us to do is, um, because the topic of today's talk is recognizing and managing classroom behavior problems, what I want us to do now, and I'm doing this on purpose, what we've been trying to get our students to do, and they moan and groan. I'm going to make you do it now, and I bet you all are going to moan and groan. So I want you to be aware of this is what it feels like to be in your class. I want us to get in small groups, and we're going to be working together, and I'm going to give you an assignment to talk about in your small group um, that's going to help you brainstorm how to handle these problems. Because that's part of, part of the goal of the talk is for you to lead with some strategies to manage things like this and other things that come up. So we're, we've got... Um, 10, 10 items, I don't know if we want to get into 10 groups, probably five groups, however you want to divvy that up. And each group is going to take two, two of these topics and I'll assign the topics. So kind of cluster together so I can see which group is which. Probably two groups over here and three groups over here. So if you don't like this, getting in small groups, remember this is what you ask your students to do and you may want to rethink how you do it, how you use it.
I just use the keyboard type that you can use in my class. And then I just use my lecture or I'll just get them. Nobody's going to wear until I open it. Unless you don't want to notice that. Definitely going to be obsessed with it. And then, you know, descend upon the room and eventually the uh, violators will notice and be quiet. And that's, okay. that's when we ran out of time. They okay. kind of have some passive solutions. Ignore it, wait for it to stop, okay? What do we think of those solutions? If we are, we're, we're short on time, we've got a lot to cover and they're talking and it may take quite a while to let the, you know, the noise die down. And you were sharing with me about some kids who were just talking and didn't even realize you had stopped the lecture. They were just going on and on and on and on. So how could we do something a little more active or proactive or uh, uh, assertive, aggressive, however you want to phrase it? Any ideas about that? I do the timeout sign. Okay. It's sure. really fast and it, it's, it's visual. Uh -huh. And you don't create this feeling of hostility. Good. I'm not pointing out some particular okay. person. And it usually works. Okay, good. What, is, what do you mean? Time, time out? out. Oh, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I just say my turn. My turn. Good. Okay. Good. Art, are you raising your hand? Yeah, I walk, when I get that, I walk back and get out of the professional distance. I walk back and stand there and continue the lecture from Way the far back right. of the room right where it's at. Okay. And I Good. just, you know, I don't say anything. I don't acknowledge it. I just go back talk there and continue Good. to talk. I can talk from the front room and talk from the back. And that's effective, too, with the sleeping person, especially if they're snoring, <laughs> to start talking right next to them. So drawing more attention to where it's coming from is pretty good. And you don't necessarily have to humiliate anybody, degrade anybody, embarrass it. It's just, I'm moving around the room now. And, okay, so that's another strategy. Any other good ideas? If you have students doing group work, you really have to deal with it. True, true. Okay, good. All right, you guys also had um, packing up, my favorite. I want to hear about this. All right, um, ignore it. Okay. This is not in any particular order, okay. all right. Uh, stop lecturing and ask for their attention. Uh, make a statement, it's not time to leave, no one is leaving until I'm through. Uh, use humor as an approach. Okay, good. And that's, that's good. So simply just saying, we're, we still have time, I'm not done yet. Yeah. I walk over and close the door when they start packing up. They stand there. You can't hold out the hands up. Chase them to their desk. Any other ideas? 
And I should be writing these down. I'm sorry, I was going to write them on the board. But what I have found to be effective is that when they start packing up, I said, oh, wait a minute, you paid for three more minutes. <laughs> you so use your humor again. <laughs> their general strategy, that's a bit specific comment. Some of them have gotten used to the fact that two or three minutes before the class is due to end, I close my lecture, I tell them to pack up and sit still for a few minutes and think about what we talked about in class today. And then I dismiss it. Yeah. If you have a summarizing activity, like before you go, write three sentences, uh -huh. that gets their attention. I like to, again, I always throw in the quiz. I start to talk about the quiz right when they're starting to pack up because everybody wants to hear about the quiz. And I speak very softly to get them to listen. Where arts approach might be maybe louder or go where they are, another opposite approach is just get quieter and talk about something they really want to hear about. The extra even if you just make it up, you lie. There's no real extra credit assignment, or there's no real quiz, but it gets their attention, and then remind them we're not done yet. All right, who had, um, where are we, sleeping in class? Sleepless in Seattle. Um, Sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> well, we all discussed uh, our, uh, our ways of dealing with sleeping in class, and the consensus, really all of us agreed that we tend to ignore sleeping in class unless they're snoring or unless they're in the front of the classroom, obviously sound asleep while we're lecturing, at which point we would, either if they're snoring, uh, tap on them and ask them not to snore if they be snoring. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then after class, we'll speak to people. Okay. I used to ignore sleeping too, um, but I was trained also as a hypnotherapist, and I believe in the power of suggestion. So if one person is sleeping, I don't want that to be contagious, so I decided I'm not going to let people just sleep. I'm going to walk over to them. I'm going to tap them. I, I gave the example where if I asked the girl, would you, would you want me to sleep where you work? You know, I'm working. Go sleep in your car if you're that, that sleepy. I try not to be humiliating and embarrass them, but the point is this is my classroom. Um, you should be engaging in, in what's going on here, and if you really don't want to, hi, if you really don't want to, um, you know, that's your prerogative, but you can't sleep in my classroom. Plain and simple. And I used to ignore it, but that's a philosophical shift I've just made recently. So again, you can handle it the way you want to handle it. Yeah. I always look really concerned and ask them, are you ill? <laughs> Good. And, yeah. and yeah. that snaps them out of it and it tends to work. Yeah. Well, the one girl that I, I finally had to ask her, would you want me to sleep? You know, she worked in a shoe store. And you want me to lay across you know, the chairs while you're fitting shoes and go to sleep. She um, was just constantly sleeping. I was constantly going over to her. And, she would just, you know, so asking her, are you ill? Because I really was wondering, did she have narcolepsy or something? You know, so that's good to kind of use humor, a little sarcasm, but actually some concern. Maybe you really are. Okay, good. Any other ideas on that one? I call them. Call them. Good. Yes. Good. That's always, that's a good message for just about anything. Good. Good. Then they sleep talk, and they're actually answering correctly. They're still asleep. What about um, doing another course's work during your class? Who had that one? We didn't get around to that. Okay. What would you? What would everybody do with that one? Doing some of it, doing the math, graphing their math things in my psychology class. And it's obvious they're not doing my psychology class. We're, we're I'm lecturing and they're doing graphs. It's not even a small group, and you know they can get away with looking like they're writing something. Down. How would you handle that? This generation is so caught up with being disrespectful or dissing. So I use that phraseology with them a lot of times. I say, I would never be disrespectful to you. Why do you feel be comfortable being disrespectful to me? It's amazing how if they think they're being disrespectful or dissing, they don't do that. Okay. So if you put it in that category, sometimes you get a big response. Mm -hmm. And that brings up another strategy, kind of a general strategy. The more you can use the language of your audience, so to speak, the more rapport you can develop and the less likely they'll um, be inclined to disrespect you. So just to even say, why are you dissing me by doing your math homework? Anytime I use, you know, some uh, vernacular, so to speak, ebonics, whatever it might be, the students love that and they perk up and they listen to everything I have to say for the rest of the hour. So that's a good approach is to kind of engage them in their own um, you know, language or, or ideas. Yes? I've uh, just this past year taken a few minutes during the first week to ask the students to identify behaviors they expect of the instructor and of the students. I let them do it. I don't give them. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what they come up with. 
and then either I or one of the students will type all those up and we'll distribute them to each person so they'll have right. it with their syllabus. That's right. And peer pressure takes care of them. Good. We'll mention that as a strategy too. Okay, who has um, pager going off? Yeah, I didn't know there were any physicians in my class. Yeah. You ever deliver a baby or something? <laughs> Please don't let your pager to phones disturb. Okay. Now, you have an emergency. Sure, you know, sure. If it's a family emergency, or husband has to work overtime, it's quite best to pick somebody up after school. Mm -hmm. Now, that you raise a good um, issue of, if any of these happen every blue moon, that's not a big deal. But when it's always the same student, always has a pager going on, always doing other work, or multiple students in each class are doing one or two of these things, that's when it becomes problematic. So obviously we recognize there's emergencies or isolated circumstances, but when you start seeing the patterns, that, that's when it becomes problematic. What about the excuses? Who has, which group has that? Our group um, so agreed that we all set prior expectations or set prior consequences for late work or absences, and we just don't accept excuses, we don't dispute them, but you don't need an excuse, this is the consequence, so I'm sorry, but... It's a mood issue, because you said the expectation. Good. What about um, foul or offensive language? Or does that happen to anybody? Where it may not necessarily be cursing, but just inappropriate content. <laughs> that may be with our group. Okay. And suggestion. Um, I'm sure I didn't hear that right. But I'll answer your question anyway. <laughs> well, the best phrase I heard um, a while back was, I'm sure your intention was not to offend us or blah, 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 blah. So you can still encourage the, ex the free expression, but to express it differently. Um, begging for extra credit, where they never come to class and never do anything on time, yet in the 11th hour, please can you give me an extra credit assignment, which actually makes more work for me. Now why should I have to do more work at the last minute when you've been responsible? Which group has that? I think one of them is to have um, assignments where you have five you have five grades, but you actually give seven. So there is a chance for some extra that's in there throughout oh. the semester. Five quizzes that are only grade. Like I've got two. One quiz a week and they add up to a certain number. If you miss two, you oh, okay. got that you can drop the lowest grade. And another one that I've done is I have a preset already there, you want it, it's there, you don't need to ask for it throughout the semester. So that's kind of nipping it in the bud before it's properly, so what they call it, primary prevention, I guess? Or just flat say you don't have it. Okay, good. What about, a lot of people mentioned this morning, arriving late and being disruptive, and others added leaving early and being disruptive. <coughs> that's I guess the first two. Do you agree? No? Did anybody get that? This one in and out of class. Okay. Um, you were just Specifically concentrating on those that leave in the middle and you know come back and do it repeatedly. Um, one thing I finally started doing for repeat offenders, I strolled out the door with them. <laughs> and in the hall, I said, you know, if you really are sick and you need to keep leaving, that's fine. But if you're not, there's no reason to leave. And I mean, it really did take care of the problem. Wait. Well, let this serve you all your collective experience and expertise. I didn't think in two semesters of teaching I was going to be able to come up with the, you know, 
the rules and strategies for dealing with these things. So what you just heard, let that serve as your guide for managing these kinds of behaviors, okay? Bravo, great job. Okay. You can either stay in your little coffee flashes or you can kind of rearrange, it's up to you. Let me kind of summarize a little bit with some, some general guidelines. The first that I'm hearing a lot, and talk about building some things into the syllabus, um, this gentleman talked about having the class decide what's, what are the expectations and what's appropriate uh, for the professor and the students. But setting the expectation, I put on the first day, but at least very early on, setting the expectation that I am in charge of this classroom, you're in charge of your own learning, I'm, I'm the final authority on what goes and what doesn't go in my classroom. My expectation is that you, whatever you've got in your syllabus about coming on time, being late, missing work, blah, 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 whatever your expectations are, I think it's only fair to set them early on. If you're going to be holding people accountable down the road, they should at least know what to expect to begin with. And again, we use the family feud game as just one idea of how to make that fun in terms of setting the expectation. So whether you do it verbally or preferably in writing in your syllabus, that's an important um, general strategy. I think this is important too. Show that you're serious about your expectations by nipping it in the bud. I didn't mean to pick on your group, but in terms of just ignore it, hope that it goes away, you know it doesn't go away. So to nip it in the bud, however you need to do it, um, whether you take them outside of class, catch them after class, even give them a note to read later, um, or just come right up and use humor to, to nip it in the bud, to let them serve as an example for the rest of the class. Whoosh, I guess she is serious. So show that you're serious about the expectations and nip them in the bud. We've mentioned humor a couple of times. But my forte, I actually am a frustrated stand-up Vegas comic. Remember the show Star Search? And you had all these cats. I, I coined a phrase called the Star Search Dilemma. If I were ever to go on Star, Star Search, I didn't know if I should go as the comedian, the spokesmodel, the actor, and I played instruments, I could have been in the band too. So humor is something I like to use, whether I'm doing therapy or teaching or whatever. Someone else mentioned peer pressure. Again, with the family feud game, I've had lots of students um, nudge one another and say, remember if her pet peeve is packing up early, you better not do that, you don't want to piss her, up, piss her off. And they use um, you know, humor themselves, but the peer pressure thing can really, really work. Especially when you see that the other large age group is the 25 to 34 year old student who tends to be the very serious student who's sacrificing a lot to be in your class, they work, they've got families, they don't want anybody messing around with their class time, joking and, and being disruptive. So if you can kind of enlist um, their, their assistance, that's a good group to kind of tackle on. Okay. okay, now we're going to talk about um, something that I do have an expertise in that many of you may not. All of you have been teaching for years, you know about all that other stuff. It's related to either bad attitudes or immaturity. Um, or just people being irresponsible about um, their own learning process. But now we're going to talk about behavior problems that stem from um, either mental illness or emotional disturbance, okay, where there's actually really something going on above and beyond. They're just a pain in the neck type of student. Okay? And I'm, again, I'm not used to the screen and the computer, so if I'm blocking people, I'm sorry about that. Behaviors that cause subjective discomfort and or are... Um, behaviors that get in the way of a person being able to conduct their day-to-day -day activities. Now, um, emotional disturbance could also mean they deviate from societal norms, and that's like the Ted Bundy. He's mentally ill, he deviates from societal norms, but he's not experiencing any subjective discomfort. In fact, he's getting a kick out of being a, a social deviant. So we're going to include that as well. Um, but overall, it's going to be maladaptive either for the person directly or it's so irritating for you that it's going to have consequences on them whether or not they really care about it. Okay? We're going to look at um, four categories of emotional disturbance. Mood disorders, which <coughs> will include depression um, and what we call mania, or some people call bipolar disorder. Uh, anxiety disorders, which would be things as simple as severe test anxiety post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder where the person is very rigid and can't really um, be flexible, personality disorders which we'll talk about in a good deal of detail, and lastly psychotic disorders, okay? And believe it or not, we have people, you, some of you may even be some of these things, but we certainly have students <laughs> who meet these criteria. 
Somebody, I, I won't say who it was, said when they read the flyer, it said antisocial, bipolar, and compulsive, they said, oh, that's me, I guess I better go. I was talking about the student. <laughs> We're first, oh, that is so cool, look at that. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara Okay, signs of depression. The first um, um, emotional disturbance we'll talk about is depression. Okay. <clears throat> I think I pressed my slide too soon. Pretend that, oh, I can go back. Good job. Okay. Let's go back. <laughs> um, let me read a few scenarios to you, and you tell me, are, are these things that maybe you've kind of experienced in your classroom before, and do you think this might qualify as a mental illness? Okay. Donna dances into class and immediately becomes the center of attention. With sweeping gestures of her arms and dramatic displays of emotion, she boasts about her weekend to the class. During lecture and discussion on a controversial topic, she reacts with an outburst of anger and calls the professor a fascist. Shortly thereafter, she faints and has to be taken outside for fresh air. Seen any pieces of that, perhaps, in your class? Maybe not the whole shebang, but maybe the person comes in and inappropriately boasts about their weekend. They come in and they want to be the center of attention when they come in, whether it's through being humorous or having some kind of drama going on, or they're self-disclosing in a discussion and they break down and start crying, and everybody kind of is like, oh my goodness, what's going on, okay? Some of you maybe have experienced little pieces of that. That qualifies as a mental disturbance, and we'll, we'll talk about the category that's there later on. How about this one? William wanders into class but doesn't stay long. <clears throat> the negative forces in the room are unsettling to his psychic soul spot, he says. His classmates feel uneasy about, about being around him and describe him as an aloof space cadet. Anybody have those weirdos? Some of them? You! They're all in your class. They've been here a long time. Okay. <laughs> they live in the libraries. They do. They, they, they're right. They really do. They do. They really do. Okay. So some of you may have seen those. If you haven't seen that yet, you will eventually, or maybe you didn't take this workshop so you didn't know quite how to recognize that, but there's that gut feeling that something's wrong with this person, okay? Next one, I hope you haven't seen her. Sherry comes to class drunk and sneaks sips of liquor from a flask. Laughing and giggling, she flirts with several classmates and passes notes expressing her deep affection for them. Once during break, she went off and propositioned a repairman for sex. After a violent argument with her professor about a quiz, she locked herself in the bathroom stall and attempted to swallow a bottle of aspirin. You may not necessarily see that person acting out in that way on campus, but we've got plenty of people who do that kind of thing at home or in other settings, okay? How about, I know you guys, I've, I had this guy in both classes, uh, both semesters this, in one class. Winston, these are made up names always dominates class discussions and finds a way to mention his trip to Europe, his new Mercedes, and his favorite French restaurants. People seem bored being around him, but he keeps right on talking. When he makes a cruel and unjustified critical remark about <coughs> the professor, he cannot apologize for his obvious blunder. He tries to talk his way around it, and even seems to be blaming the professor for being upset. Anybody have that person who monopolizes and always comes back to them? They make insensitive remarks, okay? That's a form of mental illness. Okay, and I'll explain how and, and why. Now I'm going to move to my first category we'll talk about is depression. You tell me, what does a depressed student look like in class? <coughs> Withdrawn and quiet. Agitated. Agitated. Nothing <coughs> but nervous ticks. Nervous ticks? Possibly. Irritable. Irritable. He, he knows, he's a counseling guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's trouble completing. Trouble completing things. That's all. Often after. Okay. Sounds good so to me. One of the sleepers in the back of the room. Possibly, yeah. Now, you've seen this, what, three times? <laughs> Here we are. These are some of the symptoms or signs of depression. So this is the part of the workshop where you're learning how to recognize different um, emotional disturbances, and these will all be on the handout, so you don't have to write these down. Um, a person who, and this sometimes comes out if you have a written assignment for the English professors, or um, who, who give the types of assignments where they do a lot of self-disclosure in their writing, or in a class discussion, or they come to your office hours, and they express a lot of guilt, I'm so sorry I missed this class, or I'm so sorry this happened or that happened, and, and you can tell they just feel worthless, and they're apologizing for even existing and being in your class. Sense of hopelessness, helplessness. It's 
sleep disturbance that aren't mentioned. They're either sleeping a lot or they can't sleep at all. I get a lot of students when we talk about sleep disorders in my class who say, I'm suffering from insomnia. I don't sleep at all. But then you have the ones who sleep all the time. What did you do for spring break? Oh, I slept. You mean for a week straight? Yeah, I slept. I didn't do anything. Appetite disturbance where they're either eating a lot or they're not eating at all. They've just lost their appetite. And they may say some things in conversation or in a class discussion that would be a, a red flag for you that that's happening. Or someone who suddenly is just gaining a lot of, excuse me, losing a lot of weight. You're not so much going to see it gaining the weight with sudden, but suddenly, you know, a week later they just look withdrawn in the face and, and very thin. Someone who has a lot of physical complaints, and that's possibly why they're missing a lot of class. They've got a lot of headaches all the time. Stomach aches, we see that sometimes with depression as well. Fatigue and low energy. Um, a person who's always been dressed ni nicely and neatly and has good grooming all of a sudden is a mess in class. But sometimes we see the, the flip side where um, they may really start dressing up to try to hide just how bad they feel on the inside. Women might wear a whole lot more makeup, etc. They may stop coming to class, they're turning in work late, or it's messy, or it's just not of the same quality that it used to be, and they're losing enthusiasm um, and they, they're having trouble concentrating. Now obviously this list could be a whole lot of other things too, but what I'm trying to um, share with you is just some of the red flags. If you see some of these things, you want to go see Howard Taylor, or come give me a call and say what's going on and the folks in the counseling office. So this, this might be a student who is depressed, okay? Any questions about those? Now, in the extreme example, not only are they depressed, but they're actually feeling suicidal. They flunk the last quiz and they think, oh my God, there goes my, my A or I'm going to get an F. And how am I going to get that job and I'll lose my scholarship. Um, anything that could kind of be the straw that breaks the camel's back. I've had plenty of students who um, have had great relationships break up and they were already <coughs> depressed to begin with and that was very obvious. And then the boyfriend dumps them right before the final exam and they go into a tailspin and they become suicidal. And they see students who, for whatever reason, are feeling suicidal. And some of the red flags for suicide would be if they actually tell you, I'm thinking about killing myself or hurting myself. You never want to just blow that off. If somebody ever says something along those lines, take it very seriously. Whether it's real or not, you have to take it as if, as if it's um, legitimate. If they express some thoughts or intent, of hurting themselves, you need to ask them, have, do you have a specific plan? And some people think if you ask about suicide, you're going to put the idea in their head. You're not putting anything in their head that's, that's not already there. But you need to know if they just start talking about, you know, I have this gun, I can blow my brains out with it. That's a red flag that maybe they're suicidal, especially if it's a lethal method or a very accessible method. Okay. Now if they talk about this taking a few aspirins or something, it's not very lethal, but it's still a sign that something's going on and you want to get them the appropriate help. We'll talk about how to make referrals to the right people. Someone who has very few social resources, whenever you see them, they're sitting by themselves, even in like the smoking area outside Hastings, they're still up by themselves. Okay. They, they express to you that they really don't have anybody to talk to, no, no support in their life. That's a red flag that if they've got everything else with the depression and all these other symptoms, that's something that you want to look out for. Certainly anybody that, um, had made a previous attempt. People, um, I've heard lots of people who said, I would kill myself, but it's against my religion. Or I'd kill myself, but I don't want to go to hell. That's when you, you know, I'm not a Christian counselor, but that's when I start acting like I'm a, you know, a Christian therapist, and I'm talking about God and all these things. People who don't have any religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs, um, who are going through a lot of depression and other problems, are going to be more, more at risk for being suicidal than some who don't have a religious or spiritual um, foundation. A lot of recent stressors if they start giving away their prized possessions. You know, here, here Ms. Preble, here's this, you know, my favorite book on sociology that's autographed by the author. I'd like for you to have it. That with a history of all these other signs and symptoms of depression would be, that would not be a good thing. They start giving away all their favorite stuff. Someone who abuses alcohol or drugs, um, they may get drunk or high and, and in that um, altered state of consciousness may be impulsive and may have bad judgment and actually do something that, that would end up in them ser seriously hurting themselves or actually killing themselves by mistake because they're so impaired. So that's a real problem. Um, we talk about just symptoms of depression in general and poor coping skills in general. So now you're experts in how to recognize uh, 
uh, the possibility of depression. Now that you've seen this list, do you think, hmm, maybe that student who was new, or maybe that student who came to see me in the last week of class, maybe they were depressed. And you might think, and maybe I've seen this kind of person before. Okay, there's over 11 million people in the U.S. who are diagnosed as clinically depressed. So the chances that you've seen some of them in your classes are very great. So be on the lookout um, for, for somebody with these signs. Yes. I just wanted to add, just I don't know if it's coincidence, uh, coincidence or not, but four students this semester alone and all, uh, across my sections have come to me in the first few weeks of the semester to share with me that they're now on Prozac. Mm -hmm. Two have given me the doctor's note. I don't know why I needed that, but the, they were apologizing in advance if they were to exhibit yes. some kind of unusual behavior that the doctor said there would probably have to be adjustments to the dosage and right. so on and so forth. But I found that quite interesting. Right. I had that too. Yeah, and you know, and what do you, what do you teach, sir? I teach English. English, okay. Because I, I think that it's true, people in the social sciences, the students are gonna be more likely to come, human services, fields like that, to come and tell them what's going on. Because we're talking about depression and things like this in our classes, um, and I don't want to stereotype, I won't even say anything more, but just kind of what we're doing in our classes is conducive to them coming and sharing some, some different types of things with us that they may not share with, a, with another course professor. Um, so yeah, a lot of people are on medication and I've had that where they tell me in advance, I'm gonna have dry mouth as a side effect, so if I go in and out a lot, since we're not allowed to have drinks anymore in the classroom, you know, please excuse me, I'll sit near the door so I'm not too disruptive. So you'll hear things like that. And, you know, when you hear people saying, I'm on Prozac, I'm on, um, what are some of the other ones? Um, Zoloft, I'm saying. Paxil, Zoloft, Prozac. Those are the big ones. There's another brand new one that just came out, too, that's competing with Paxil and Zoloft. Right. So when you hear those, they give you the doctor's note that says Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, you know those are antidepressants. So that's kind of what they're dealing with. So it's good to be aware of that. Peggy, I, I would add one other thing that I, I think we're observing too, as, as mental health becomes a more open subject in our society, we are having an increase in more and more therapists using Thomas Nelson or education as a reality milieu for huh. people to yes. come to, yes. and oftentimes they encourage their client to also approach an instructor or so on in order to let them know that they're in this process. Right. But it's also a testing ground for them, uh, too. And you may see students who go through the Office of Students with Disabilities, where the me their mental illness or their drug addiction, if they're in treatment for it, is considered a, a, a disability, where they, where they might be um, legally um, entitled to accommodations. I've had students who, um, because of their mental illness, they get a doctor's note that says it's le a legitimate accommodation to allow them to take tests by themselves. They have a, an anxiety disorder talk about next that um, you know they get too upset and anxious so they need a testing environment that's distraction free so you're going to see students coming to you with mental health more and more any other questions or comments next we have manic depression or, or first let's talk about mania what mania looks like in general um, A manic student might come to class disheveled um, because they haven't been sleeping in days. Literally, they may get four hours, hours of sleep over the course of four days. Um, they may be unshaven or unkempt, or they may be very, very much made up with, with makeup and things of that nature, their hair all done up. They may enter the room with great fanfare. Um, they may speak unintelligibly and using a lot of grandiose ideas. Um, they're going to be uh, very fidgety and unable to sit still. They're going to be jumping all over the place with their thoughts and what they're saying. Um, their, their speech might be what we call pressure, where literally it feels like if they don't spit out what they're trying to say, they're going to explode. That's a person who we say might be in a manic phase. And typically manic phases go along with depressive phases, and it, it's commonly known as manic depression, um, but technically it's called bipolar disorder. And there are a lot of students walking around this campus who have bipolar disorder. When I worked um, with the Community Services Board, now Patient Mental Health, I had, out of 60 clients on my caseload, I had a handful who were students either at Thomas Nelson or CNU. And I know a lot of our Thomas Nelson students go on to CNU. Uh, I saw, when I worked at CNU, I saw a lot of students who I used to see in counseling 
in therapy who have bipolar disorder. So we see a lot of that. Um, so the manic phase is going to be the elevated or euphoric mood, expansive mood, and what we mean by that is they have a mood that literally feels like it's filling up the room, that they are there and you know it and their emotions are kind of all over the place. Or they, it can also manifest itself with a lot of irritability. Um, the manic person is very, very grandiose in their ideas. Um, they think they can do everything. You assign them a project and they want to make it even bigger than it was and they say they can have it for you tomorrow and they actually may be able to get it tomorrow because they stay up all night and they just don't sleep for days and days and days. Um, Flight of ideas I mentioned, pressure speech, distractibility, increased motor activity, just moving, fidgeting, can't keep still. And lastly, you'll see sometimes an increased involvement in pleasure-seeking activities and often destructive. And what we mean by that is some people when they're manic, they go out and engage in a lot of promiscuous um, sex, unprotected sex, multiple partners. Um, they go out and go on shopping sprees, which is very pleasurable, but can be destructive because they just don't have the money there. They charge up huge, huge bills. Um, where they go out and do risky things, they ride motorcycles in the rain and things of that nature because they feel indestructible, like they can do anything. And we have students walking around this campus who are men, okay? Um, I'm gonna kind of, at the end of talking about all these disorders, talk about what we should do, and it's kind of similar for almost all of them. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. Actually, let me talk about depression and mania um, together in terms of what you can do. Now, in general, if somebody's depressed, you want to show compassion for them. You know, I'm very sorry that you're depressed. Boy, it sounds like a shirt. There's a lot that you're dealing with. But your paper is due. So you want to be generous and genuine and kind and compassionate. But again, going back to our, our first topic, you want to set the expectation. You want to be the authority figure. You want to set the limits that this is what's required. And even with a student who has a disability, a documented disability, they still have to be able to meet the standard of the classroom. If it's with accommodations, great. But they still have to meet the standard. So if someone who's depressed, I'm sorry, you know, my heart goes out to you, but your assignment is due next week or whatever. That's very important. Um, one theory about depression is that there is some secondary gain to it, that it's all of the nice coddling and sympathy that people get that keeps them depressed, and they learn to just kind of be helpless. So you don't want to feed into that by letting them just have carte blanche in your class. They still have to meet the requirements of the class, but you want to do it with compassion um, and, and some generosity to some extent. Um, you want, always want to talk with a student, whether they're depressed or manic, Pull them aside privately if you have concerns about their behavior. You're looking, you know, depressed. You're sleeping a lot, or you just your tone is just not as enthusiastic as, as it used to be. I'm concerned about you. You don't want to do that in front of the whole class. A person who's manic and who's inappropriate and who's dancing in into the classroom and inappropriately sharing about their weekend, you you kind of try to nip that. And as they're saying it, we have ways of shutting people down that are not too um, degrading or. or you know, demeaning, but after class, pull them aside and say, what, what you're doing in class is inappropriate. It, it seems to me there might be something wrong. I'm concerned about you. Let me make this referral, and we'll talk about making referrals in a few minutes. Okay? So that's, in general, kind of what you want to do. And my theme here is, again, you are in charge. You are the manager in your classroom. You set the expectation. You command that respect and, and that authority. This is what you're required to do, to do in my classroom. I'm sorry you're mentally ill. Of course, you don't put it quite that <laughs> Bluntly, I'm sorry, you know, you're having problems, but, okay. <laughs> now, another category of mental illness, personality disorders. If I stand right in the middle, can everybody see? Um, this isn't going too bad. I thought I'd be, I wrote out everything I wanted to say in case I got lost with pressing all the buttons, but now it's cumbersome to have it all right now. Um, actually, I think I skipped one. I didn't make a slide for it. Let me talk real quickly about anxiety disorders. I think I mentioned um, uh, test anxiety. A student comes to class and they're like totally freaking out uh, during a test. Or I've had students who, I have an oral presentation that's required in my class, and I've had a few students say, I just can't do it. I had an anxiety disorder. I had panic attacks. Can I please do something else besides do this oral presentation? And for them, anxiety is just this intense, overwhelming thing that sometimes is out of the blue, Sometimes it's just um, unrelated to what's going on, um, where they just can't function because they have so much anxiety. It's not just you and I every now and then get nervous. They really cannot function because of anxiety. 
and I brought my a prop for the demonstration to show you what anxiety disorders are like. Anybody get nervous with balloons popping? Anybody have a pen? A pen? 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 like for somebody. It's unexpected anxiety. Oh my God. And that's how they feel. This is what, that's, that's a panic attack. Anxiety, panic anxiety. This is an anxiety disorder. These are dollar store balloons. <laughs> now you know why. <laughs> you get what you pay for, right? Now, I have an anxiety disorder. I know what the panic attack is like. My anxiety disorder is I'm walking around with this balloon all day, poised with a pen. I don't know when it's going to pop again. I'm so overwhelmed because I'm just worrying. I feel like I'm going to go crazy. I have that, it just, that panic just scared me so bad that last time. Oh my God, what if this balloon pops again? That's what an anxiety disorder is like. Panic is boom, it's over with. My heart's racing. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. An anxiety disorder is a student who's walking around all day with this balloon, not knowing when it's going to pop again, and looking over their shoulder, worried they're going to be overwhelmed with anxiety. Okay? They feel like they're going crazy when they're, you know, I'm sure you would too. Um, they think they're having heart attacks. They call 911 a lot, thinking they're having a heart attack. It's really just panic and anxiety. So that's another um, mental illness you may see in the classroom. You may see someone under the big umbrella of an anxiety disorder who has post-traumatic stress disorder. They've been raped, or they were a, a combat veteran, and they think that the helicopters are still coming after them. They hear the jets go overhead, and they crouch in the corner, and maybe you won't even see all that, but that's what they're experiencing on the inside. What you may be more likely to see is all the avoidance behaviors that they go through. They just don't come to class on the day of the oral presentation. I had one that was required last semester that like in each class, three or four people just plain didn't show up on the day they were scheduled to go. And one or two of them came to me later and said, I have tremendous anxiety about speaking in public. You know, more than just the average nervous person, where they really just were like, I can't do it. Okay? So that's something to be on the, on the lookout for. Next. No, it's already up. Okay. Personality disorders. These are fun to talk about. Personality disorders are probably what you've most likely seen and knew something's wrong with this person. Okay? That's where the person's um, kind of prevailing traits and their um, personality patterns are very deeply ingrained and they're very maladaptive. The way they are, who they are, is problematic. Okay? To such an extent that it's maladaptive. Either they can't function or they're pushing people away because they're just so obnoxious to be around. We, we used to talk about um, OPD, obnoxious pers personality disorder. But that's kind of what these are like. If it's not causing a lot of distress for the person themselves, it's called an emotional disturbance or mental illness because of what it, how it affects everybody else. It just pushes people away and pisses people off. Okay? Some examples are antisocial personality, and the classic example would be your Ted Bundy, where they have no regard for um, societal norms and laws and rules, and they may even get off on um, breaking the law and killing people and you know, things of that nature. We probably have some antisocial personality um, disorders in our classrooms. Often very irresponsible, manipulative, and hostile behavior that you see with antisocial personality. Histrionic personality disorder hi, is the person who's overly dramatic, overly expressive with their emotion. They're the ones who say, you know, bring me the vapors, and we may not see it to that extent, um, in, in our classrooms, but we, we all have those very dramatic people who like to call attention to themselves, who come into the class late with great fanfare. You, most people say, oops, sorry I'm late, and they kind of sneak in and, and hunch and slither to their seat. The histrionic person comes late, and they want everybody to know I'm here now, okay? Very, very um, dramatic in attention seeking. Passive aggressive person would be, um, um, Susie gets an F on the last quiz, and she thinks I graded it unfairly. A few weeks later, I mentioned there's this great videotape I wish I could show in class, but I just don't have it. And Susie says, I have it. Susie's never absent from class. She promises she'll bring the videotape. And I've scheduled the whole lecture around this tape she promised to bring in. The day comes, Susie's not there. She's expressing her hostility indirectly. We call that passive-aggressive. 
Someone who characteristically operates like that has what we call personality disorder. And I'm kind of simplifying it. There'd be a whole checklist of things that you'd use to diagnose it, but that's kind of what it looks like. She's, she's, a, she's hostile towards you, she's angry with you. She'll never come out and say, you know, Dr. Norwood, I'm pretty upset getting this F, I think you didn't grade it fairly. She's just gonna smile and promise to bring the videotape and she's sitting at home saying, I showed her, okay? So that's called passive aggressive. Um, obsessive compulsive uh, personality disorder. And this is different from the anxiety disorder that's called OCD, where the people, uh, Oprah just had a show on this. Um, people who are driving in their car with OCD, they go over any little crack in the road and they pull over the car, they check and they recheck, they think they've run over somebody, it takes them all day to go five blocks because they have this intrusive, obsessive thought that I'm gonna kill somebody and the compulsive ritual of checking and rechecking, or the hand, compulsive hand washing. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a personality style that's very rigid, that's very perfectionistic. Students who always have to have their books laid out just a certain way and they always have to um, write a certain heading on all the papers they turn in even when you tell them to do it a different way. They have to have it just so. All They come to the quiz with seven pencils real sharpened and all lined up, okay? And we, I mean, I'm, I'm making a comic illustration of it, but that's kind of the personality trait. If you've ever heard the expression anal retentive, that's the obsessive. <laughs> Somebody's saying, I am anal retentive. Well, I'm so successful. Okay. So that's obsessive compulsive personality disorder. That's what that looks like. Borderline personality disorder. Anybody ever see the movie Fatal Attraction? Remember Glenn Close's character? She's what we would call a borderline personality disorder. Very, very um, volatile moods, very um, sudden changing mood where one minute she's sweet and nice, next minute um, she's screaming and yelling at poor Michael Douglas. Makes a lot of um, suicide, what we call gestures, no real intention of killing themselves, but remember she cuts her wrist, she's wearing the white robe and she comes out going like this and the blood's dripping all over the place. Um, a very disturbed sense of self and personal boundaries. They're either going to just spill their guts the first day they meet you, or they're going to glom onto you, and if you kind of try to put some distance, it just sets them off and they get very, very violent or aggressive, or they go into a deep depression. So just a very volatile um, sense of mood um, and disturbed relationships, disturbed sense of self and who they are. Um, probably one of the more, most serious of the personality disorders. Narcissistic personality disorder. That was the guy who, every class period, he brings every discussion back to himself. He monopolizes every conversation and every lecture. Very much stuck on himself. Um, very um, uh, bragging a lot, boasting a lot, that kind of thing. And again, to the point that it's maladaptive, where it's pushing people away. He's offending people and doesn't even realize it, or realizes it, but just can't stop himself, okay? And lastly, what we call schizotypal, this is somebody who's not necessarily psychotic and out of touch with reality, but they're very, very weird. The space cadet, the bizarre person, they may dress funny, they may like to kind of just walk funny just for the heck of it. They say weird things that don't make any sense, but they're very much in touch with reality. They just, for whatever reason, are exhibiting a lot of the bizarre behavior, okay? Just eccentric kind of behavior. Anybody see themselves in any of these? I see myself. <laughs> That's a true question. I want to ask a question. You I was going to say. Can you combine them? That. I just want to ask about that last type. Um, I don't know how, you, how to phrase this, but so many of our very young students, I mean, I made a joke in passing in the office just before I came over here. Yesterday when I got out of my class, they took a test. I spent a lot of the hour just kind of looking around the room. It was, I don't know, it was like a time warp out of the 60s. It's like, gee, if I'd only saved all my old clothes, I could really make a fortune in the used clothing shop. But I mean, the outfits were so bizarre. The flower power, the, I mean, the flowing capes. I mean, I thought, oh my God, this looks like Halloween in here. One kid had a bicycle right. chain. I was just actually, like, well, he talked to me about, we, we have he had the same a bicycle one. chain around his neck and he's yeah. got his ear, his eyebrow yeah. pierced. Oh, two of mine in two different sections this semester came back from spring break sporting their latest additions to their body piercing. One has two huge balls pierced down here in the bottom of his lower lip and I'm like, oh. Yeah. And so, I mean, is it, are you saying, is that fad behavior or is that characteristic of that? I'm truly confused. Yeah, and I actually do a, a, the getting to know you exercise, the first class, I say, find someone who has this, blah, 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 who speaks in every language, who does this, does that, and I say, find someone who has their body pierced or a tattoo, thinking, Look one, around. two, 
they're almost air, and they are proud to show them they're lifting up their shirts and you know their tongues are tat or are uh, pierced and it's disgusting. The belly buttons and everything. That's how you know when you're getting old. Those are fads. We wouldn't okay. call that schizotypal okay. behavior. It's sure. even more bizarre than just the kind of clothing that they're wearing. It's the bizarre behavior, the bizarre language, the English professors who read their poetry. It's just like really, really weird. Okay, that's <laughs> not bad poetry, very weird. And it's not just their poetry, it's how they interact with you. You know, it's kind of funny. Listening in my door. <laughs> What'd you say? Have you listening in my door? <laughs> okay, so we're talking about more than just the fad um, okay. types of weird. You know, I'm sure previous generations, their parents thought what they had on was really, really weird. You know, we think what they, these kids have on right now is really, really weird. But it's not schizotypal necessarily. Okay. It very well sure, could be. Otherwise, my whole room's full of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone get me out of there. Now again, with the um, personality disorders, and I'm, I'm just a beating a dead horse on a broken record, you need to let them know what the expectations are, what the parameters are, what the limits are, that you're in charge. So if they want to come in being antisocial, you set them straight, usually privately. If they want to come in being histrionic, you pull them aside and say, listen, it's very disruptive when you come in. Let's stay focused. We're talking about this, not your weekend exploits, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to use those same types of strategies even for this stuff. But again, it's important to recognize this stuff so you can refer over to, to uh, the counseling office or refer outside to a therapist or a psychiatrist, okay? Um, psychotic behavior, okay? Being psychotic simply just means being out of touch with reality. And some of the things that you'll see in somebody who's out of touch with reality is they're delusional. They have false beliefs and a lot of our students have false beliefs that they actually can um, do the work in the class sometimes when they really are in over their heads. That's not what we're talking about. False beliefs with regard to, to other areas of their life, not overestimating their ability to do you know, the sociology uh, project or what have you. Um, hallucinations are false sensory experiences um, where you're seeing things that other people aren't seeing, you're hearing things that other people aren't hearing, and it's actually more common to have visual hallucinations uh, excuse me, auditory hallucinations than any other type. People are more likely to be hearing voices saying all kinds of things that you don't realize they're hearing while they're sitting in your class. Things that could be like, you know, kill her. Or, <laughs> and son of Sam, remember he, he said dog is God spelled backwards and God was talking to him through his dog to go out and kill all those people. He had um, hallucinations, auditory hallucinations. We also have somatic hallucinations. I worked with a lady once in a psychiatric hospital who um, had somatic hallucinations where she thought um, uh, rats were crawling on her body, so she was feeling on her skin the rats. Her delusion, her false belief was, my body is inhabited by rats. Her sensory experience was she felt the rats all in her body and on her skin. Okay. We see with psychotic people with disturbed mood, whether it's um, a mood that doesn't quite match the situation, where they're laughing um, hysterically when just learning about somebody who's just died or um, a mood that's just disturbed and just odd from the situation. Um, disturbed speech and thought. Um, we have something called um, word clanging, where they'll say sentences, not based on meaning, but how they rhyme and kind of flow. So they'll just say weird things like, um, I say a rhyme every time, and isn't it nice to be right on line? It's got nothing to do with trying to communicate anything. They're just kind of talking. Um, sometimes the writing that the students do it may look like clanging and what we call word salad, but it's really they just don't have rights, so you don't want to be confused. Be, be surprised when the papers are so scary. Impaired relationships. Imagine if you're out of touch with reality and you're paranoid, you have paranoid delusions, you think people are after you. It's going to be very hard to establish trusting, intimate relationships with people. Or if you're just having weird delusions, you think you're you know, the king of France, people are going to get sick of you, you know, speaking of French. And <laughs> all kinds of things, so they're going to just avoid you, so your relationships will become impaired. And what we call disturbed psychomotor behavior. When I'm sure when you go to the grocery store, every now and then you see the person who's kind of walking through the produce aisle, moving around kind of weird, they walk kind of funny, or they're just moving their hand oddly, randomly, they're just standing there going like this, um, there's a good chance they might be psychotic and they're just having odd, disturbed um, motor behavior. I love to tell this story, I'm about to tell you. I was a, an intern in psychiatric hospital when I was in Memphis. <coughs> and so I was a student, 
and they sent me into the day room to just observe the patients and interact with the patients. And um, they're in the day room all day long, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, like some of you here. Doesn't mean you belong in the psychiatric hospital, but that's really all there is to do all day. Some play pool, some just kind of sit there and they rock back and forth and you see some of these things. And I'm mingling around and I encounter this one particular man and he says, come, he sees that I'm walking around, I'm assuming, come sit with me. She makes a point of shaking my hand. Really shakes it nicely. Come sit down, talk with me. So I say, okay, hello, how are you? You know, what's your name? I'm King Dingling Sing Ding Fling Bling Bling. Literally, he was just rhyming like that as this long drawn out name, an example of clanging, what we call clanging. I am the, the king of, of Zaire. I am the prime minister of England. I'm the president of the United States. I speak Russian, English, German, Spanish, French. I have my PhD, my MD, my, my MBA. I got a perfect score on my SAT, my LSAT, my GRE, my MCAT. And he just went on and on and on, just pressured speech, so he's probably manic also, and just went on and on. He was delusional, he had all these false beliefs. He would every now and then go like this, like stop, like somebody was talking to him behind his back. And I said, yeah, I'm just a graduate student, but I think I'd say psychotic. Seems like a reasonable diagnosis. So I go back and check the chart to see what the real doctor and psychiatrist had said about him. Lo and behold, I was right. He was schizophrenic and he was manic. And I said, well, let me read and see what Mr. Actually, his name was something like Tyrone Jones. But what <laughs> King Dingaling Jingling Ling had been up to. And the nurse writes in the note, Mr. Jones was found this morning screaming hysterically in his room, masturbating wildly and rubbing semen all over his head and the walls. And I'm thinking, I just shook this guy's hand. So I'm, you know, I'm developing OCD as we speak. Also hand washing. I never shook anybody's hand. And what I would actually do was, for some reason, they all want to shake your hand. I was like, they all want to, and they usually, I think I'm Memphis, I'm in the South, they're so polite, you know. And they would want to shake my hand after that. And what I'd actually say is, no, I'm sorry, I, I'm not shaking hands with anybody anymore. I know what you guys do. And they laugh, like, you know, we're sharing this little joke. And I'm using that as an illustration, even with the most psychotic person, setting an expectation. It's inappropriate for you to be shaking my hand if you're not washing your hands. I'm not necessarily judging the fact he's masturbating, but, you know, rubbing it all over the place. I'm not shaking your hand. I can't trust that you've washed your hands properly. And I would use humor, and it worked, and they didn't bother me. So that's just an example. Somebody in your classroom could be a raving psychotic. You still need to say, this is what we do in this classroom. This is inappropriate. I'm not going to tolerate it. And you can use humor. You know, you can show your genuine disgust if you want, but, you know, you want to maintain some rapport if you can. So that's one suggestion. Okay, any questions about psychotic people? I lived a colorful life before coming here. Yeah. Um, no wonder you got burned out. <laughs> General strategies, you mentioned that already, set the expectation. Always acknowledge and deal with inappropriate behavior. Now, when it's the random, disruptive, immature behavior, that's one thing to ignore. But if somebody's psychotic in your classroom, if somebody's manic in your classroom, if somebody's having a post-traumatic stress response in your classroom where they're having a flashback, you shouldn't be ignoring that. You don't necessarily, if it's not too disruptive, you don't necessarily have to address it in class, but don't ignore um, something that's going on that seriously. Talk to them after class, acknowledge it, and deal with it. Always have that as a strategy. Speak calmly, firmly, and directly. Um, if somebody's beginning to become psychotic, they're, they've had, have, they've had a break with reality, um, you don't want to be getting all frantic with them. Try to calm yourself down. Speak very calmly. Speak very firmly. You need to calm down. You need to put down that baseball bat. Nobody's after you, or whatever the case might be. Very calmly, very firmly, very directly tell them what you need them to do. I need you to leave the room right now. I'm going to call campus police. I'm still calm. I'm firm, but I'm being direct. I'm telling them what needs to happen. And you escort them out of the classroom or get another student, call campus police, or whatever it is that you need to do. And, Howard, <laughs> you're on here. When in doubt, call campus police and get them over to your office. If they're being disruptive, I check my um, handbook. Any disruptive behavior, we're allowed to refer them to student services, and he has a, a talk with them. And they can't come back until we say it's okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Specifically, you want to be 
a good observer. Don't be up at the front of your classroom just kind of with your nose in your notes and your head up in the sky somewhere. You want to be looking and seeing what are students doing, not only in terms of facilitating their learning to see if there's blank stares that they didn't quite grasp what you just shared with them, but observe them you know, for what they're doing, what's going on with them, what their mood is like, how irritable do they seem to be, how fidgety do they seem to be. There may be some good clues there. Um, that be a good listener when they share in class about their personal experiences. They come to you during office hours. They write a paper about something. Pay attention to those things. There may be some clues about the pregnancy and other types of mental illness. Consult with the counseling office. Um, feel free to consult with me or any of the psychologists in the psychology department. Specifically, you, you do want to speak with them privately and find out what's going on. Mention that. Be directive about what you expect or want them to do. You can't just say you're inappropriate right now and leave it at that. Tell them what you need them to do or you want them to do. Don't let them manipulate you. You know, Dr. Norwood, I'm on Prozac, I'm depressed, and it gets kind of hard sometimes. Don't let them manipulate you with the sob story. Don't let them manipulate you with, if they're psychotic. And they kind of, they let you know they have these delusions and these thoughts of killing people don't let them manipulate you. I've seen students try to um, get their way by saying, I'm going to kill, I could kill that person. The case at, at Christopher Newport, where the student was acting aggressive and deliberately being intimidating to get some things out of the financial aid office. Okay? So you don't want them to manipulate you with their symptoms, and they'll try to do that, whether they're aware that they're doing it or not. You want to make a referral to a psychiatrist or psychologist when appropriate. And in my opinion, anytime you feel like you don't know what to do, and their behavior meets some of these um, red flags that I've just shared with you, open the yellow pages and say, let's find somebody you know, for you to talk to. Make that referral. You need to be upfront clear about the role you want to take in dealing with students. Some, some professors, let's say in the psychology department, have some experience in dealing with mental illness to begin with. Or some people, just because of who they are, have, have the, the uh, wherewithal to speak calmly and firmly and kind of good you know, thinking on their feet, they will take a more active role. Others of you may decide the role I want to take is I see somebody acting strange in my class, boom, I'm calling campus police. That's your prerogative just to decide just how far you want to go with it and what you want to do. But at the very least, you need to be the eyes and ears for the people who are trained to deal with it. So if you see something, make sure you let somebody know and you prefer them. I mentioned, I think, manipulation as a symptom of um, um, antisocial personality disorder. And let's just go over this real briefly. Um, students sometimes will manipulate you by just bringing up extraneous points just to get their own way. They start mentioning things just for the heck of mentioning them. They're going to criticize you or nag you about something to get their own way. And I'm mentioning this in this talk because sometimes manipulation borders on um, some kind of emotional disturbance. If this is the only way they can function is to try to manipulate you and you get in your own way. And manipulation is characteristic of somebody who's um, addicted to a, um, drugs or alcohol. That's usually a big part of, of how they operate. Um, they may use escalating anger or their pathology to try to manipulate you by getting really, really mad and hostile in your class and almost scaring you into giving them whatever they want, whatever they're asking for. Or they may talk about Oh boy, if I fail your class, I think I might kill myself. That doesn't mean give them an automatic aid. That means get, get them over to the counseling office, get them a referral to a psychiatrist or psychologist. Or they may out and out threat you, either harm you, report you to your supervisor, get you fired, give bad evaluations, and they very well may do those things. That's always the risk we run with any student. But don't let them manipulate you. They may do it anyway. Don't give in to what they're demanding just because they threaten you to do something. The nice ones who don't say anything who don't cause any trouble sometimes report you and give you bad evaluations. So don't be manipulated by that. Um, some people have some concerns. I'm just throwing in kind of a, a little hodgepodge of topics here at the end. Some people have some concerns about aggressive behavior and what to do. Anybody here ever had encounter a situation where you've had maybe some people get aggressive, um, get in your face, intimidate you? Okay, one of the First good things to do is to stand back. <laughs> so at least, you know, know what their punching reach is, what their range are, if they do taekwondo like me, you know, if they have long legs, get back far enough so that they won't kick you. Um, and in general, you want to keep appropriate personal space because you don't want to come across as confrontational if you get right up in somebody's face. 
as you're talking to them. You want to read their body language to see if they're starting to get aggressive. If you see, you know, their fists fall up, they start clenching their teeth. Okay, you want to be paying attention to those kinds of cues if you know you're in a situation where they can potentially be getting upset. Okay, um, listen to their voice. If it starts rising and louder, or trembling, or tightening up, that might mean they're about to become aggressive. You want to use appropriate eye contact where you're not glaring at them and staring at them, which can be intimidating or confrontational. You don't want to be waving your finger in their face, getting right up in their face, or even crossing your arms can be seen as confrontational. Be aware of things like that when you're dealing with someone maybe who's psychotic or manic or just a student who's getting angry or angry about some situation. You want to stand back, have an open body language, but still convey that I'm in charge here, I'm setting the, the parameters of what's going on in my class. Again, this is a theme, just be firm and direct about these are the expectations, this is what I'm going to tolerate. I won't tolerate you yelling at me. I don't appreciate you cursing at me. If you continue, I'm going to leave, or I'm going to have to ask you to leave, or I'm going to call campus police, or whatever it might be that you feel comfortable doing. Set up your physical environment for your safety. As a, as a therapist, I used to always set up my office where the client was by the door, because some clients would say, I feel closed in. I feel like, you know, I'm trapped in here. I, I want to be able to get out when I want to. So I always accommodated them. I had my office set up with their chair. It was always near the door. Until one day, this big, giant guy came in my office who shared with me. Um, he had been diagnosed with um, multiple personality disorder, and he had killed some people in the past. And he made a point of saying, and I don't mean during war, you know, during combat. <laughs> so I'm thinking, hmm, okay, I'm a little intimidated here. He might be, why is he telling me he's killed people before? And I was aware that he was blocking my exit or escape from the door. And I had no panic button or anything really on my phone that I could just run and reach for the phone and hit a button and somebody would come and save me. So it's important to recognize, and this may seem kind of extreme, but the one time you're in a situation where somebody's getting aggressive with you and angry, you want to start looking around and saying, you know, on the airplane, the stewardess says, your exits are here. You want to start looking for, how can I get out if I need to? How can I reach for the phone if I need to? Okay. And simply leave the room in your office if you do feel uncomfortable. Um, either to go get help or just to get away from it. Call campus police. That's always my I mentioned making a referral. Any questions? I'm starting to rush a little bit because I'm aware of the time. We, we're talking about making referrals if the person meets all these criteria on the checklist that I've given you about being manic or depressed or psychotic or what have you. Um, you're going to just want to suggest to them, you know, I'm a little concerned about your behavior and I think you may want to talk to a professional. Okay. Something as simple as that. Give them the appropriate phone number. So um, Iris Barker came and talked to me the other day and said, I have a student who's upset right now who um, they, they need a therapist. Can you recommend somebody? She kind of caught me off guard and I was like, gosh, who do I know? Who's still in practice? And then there's always the problem of are they going to have any openings or is there going to be a wait list? And I said, Iris, you know, you can go to the community services board, but I don't know that I can really recommend anybody right now. And I'm not sure if she, you know, told them that or not, but we want to try to have some phone numbers. And what again, what I recommend, I gave it some thought after this happened the other day. And in general, I would say, pull out the yellow pages with the student. Because I don't necessarily want to endorse one person or another anyhow and have them be mad at me if they didn't like the person. And say, here are a list of psychologists. Here are a list of psych psychiatrists. Are there any here that live near you? And, and kind of go about it in that way. So at least you can give them something concrete. Here's a name and a number. Call this person. Peggy, I, I yeah. would just add one thing along that line, that with our changing student body, sometimes it's very appropriate to ask, are you seeing a therapist? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the next question usually to ask is, are you on any medications? And the third question is, did you take them today? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> That's always the outpatient, uh, when you're an outpatient therapist. Did right. you take your lithium today? Right. Uh, <laughs> oftentimes the behavior is already known and it's a matter of making some contact or simply off meds. Mm -hmm. uh, Good, yeah. And again, your role is as, a, as an instructor, professor, faculty member, not necessarily a crisis intervention worker. So if you don't think to ask all these questions, that's, fu that's fine. Know that you can make a referral. Is that a question in the back? Yes, sir. Uh, I know in uh, high school, teachers themselves don't have to deal directly with someone who has their return to the vice principal. Right. Uh, such uh, 
Yeah, but I, I, I would have to point out that we don't operate on the book. send them to the guidance office routine in college. Uh, but I'm saying if there's a disruptive, in terms of behavior, behavior disruption in the classroom, from a student code of conduct point of view, they can go to you from a um, violent, you know, illegal thing, they go to campus police. Okay. I don't recommend this, but if you feel this person really, really isn't going to get the help they need, offer to make the call for them with them right there. If they're just so timid, or maybe they're even just so out of it, um, they can't make the call. Again, I don't recommend it because I want students to be independent and take responsibility for their own stuff. But if you think, oh boy, I'm gonna lose this one, if I don't get them to call right this minute, uh, okay, I'll call for them. Again, decide on what role you wanna take. You're under no obligation even to do this. But if you feel you, you want to, this is a student you have to rapport with or who has promise, and you don't want them to slip through the cracks, you may wanna make the call, but certainly have them right there. I wouldn't make the call when they've already left and you're running around from home making calls for them. Okay. If they refuse call the counseling office for advice, you can call me for advice. And again, um, second one there, you lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So you can only do what you can do. Now, some students may be offended by the referral, so you want to put it gently. You might say something like, I've known other students who've had similar concerns who found it very helpful to talk to a professional. Whether that's true or not, doesn't matter. And that's when he used to say, I often um, tell true stories from my made up past. So make up anything you need to say to get them, you know, I knew, I knew a student just like you who went to a therapist and boy, they're doing so well right now. It doesn't have to be true, but that may be just the nudge that you can give them for them to go ahead and feel okay about getting help. Um, in general, if you're working harder than the student, you're working too hard. If you're making all the phone calls and you're dreaming about them at night, oh my God, is this person okay? And what can I do to get this makeup test ready for them and give them this alternative assignment? And if they're so far behind because of their depression, oh my goodness, I've got to do this and that and the other. No, they don't care about what's going on in terms of their learning and, and achievement at school. You're going to be caring enough in, you know, for who you are. You, can, you don't have to do more work than they're willing to do for themselves. Okay. And lastly, um, trust your instincts. I'd rather that you made a referral that you didn't have to than to let somebody who really needed the help fall through the cracks. Okay. Questions about referrals? Okay. In summary, you are the manager of your classroom. I'm going to play my Aretha Franklin staff around here. We just ask you for a little respect. You want to convey your authority by being firm, direct, and clear. You've heard me say that quite a few times. Subliminal. Lastly, or not lastly, get help when you need it. You don't want to be out there floating around all by yourself. Our list had this student, so she came and asked me for help. And I believe she went and got help beyond that, too. So get help, whether it's campus police, a colleague, whoever it is, whoever it is. Make referrals for professional help when you need to. Have a support network to connect with. You know, all this stuff's been happening, and who do you talk to about it? You need to have some people who can talk with and support you. And lastly, <laughs> <laughs> is that cool? <laughs> That's thanks to Bert. You gotta laugh about it. You can't take it too seriously. Um, and I just, I expect everybody to use their bit. Remember I told the concert was really great. Okay. Thank you. Evaluations that folks who um, trickled in probably didn't get. Uh, you all know that this is uh, kind of an intermission. There are some refreshments in the hall, and we have a panel discussion that follows this. Uh, Howard, Dave, and Rosie, and uh, Whitney, and Peggy. And, uh, oh, right. So you're invited to go into the hall, serve yourself refreshments, uh, and we meet back in here, right? For the, uh, I guess so, yeah.